Thank you so much for that scripture reading. You know, we are the city of light. Are you getting comfortable with that new name? We're shining bright and letting the world see that wonderful truth that burns within our hearts and our lives. And one of the dynamic ways we're doing that is through the sleeping bag drive for our hungry and our homeless. They're anticipating your generosity each winter. Now for almost 10 years, we've been providing sleeping bags for homeless people in our area. This is one of the beautiful examples that someone brought in today that we're ever so grateful for. Your due unto others offerings over the past few weeks have been going towards this cause. We're just shy of our goal. We'd love to see that we've got at least 40 sleeping bags uh, this, uh, by next week or the week after so that we can really meet that need of those who come to our doors seeking for winter warmth. Now, we all know what it's like as these chilly winds have been out there. Can you imagine sleeping underneath a bridge or by a creekside underneath the trees or gathering leaves around to make an outdoor bed in this cold winter weather and how appreciative they are of the warmth of a sleeping bag. We would appreciate it if you are so moved to let me know that you'd like to give above and beyond. We've had our do unto others offerings. We're moving on for other occasions and other needs, but we are still in need of uh, those who might help us to say, I'll either donate to purchase or I've got a sleeping bag that's gently used or new that I'd be delighted to share. We want to make sure that we can meet that need to the full extent. And we have an opportunity to touch these lives with the warmth in a tangible way of God's love. Would you bow your heads with me one more time? Because I would like to just take a deep breath and center on this dynamic text that we've just read. Breathe in. And let's breathe out. Once again, take that deep breath in, acknowledging the sweet and holy presence, the presence of God that is speaking to us even now as we've centered our hearts. Amen. Do you know why you're here? I know. I know why you've come. Now, you may think you came for the dinner on the grounds and all that good food and great cooking. Now, you may came thinking you came for some hugs and some love and some connection and community, and that's good too. And you may have come because you came to check things out, but you're really here because there's innate desire within you to know God. That's why we come to worship. That's what drives us to coming to church. That's why everyone comes together in collective community to worship because we have this innate desire within us that says, I want to know more. I want to get an understanding. I want to have this comprehension about this dynamic connection I can have with this universal presence that's all around us and within us. I want to tell you what, today, let's make it our intention. That we want to awaken that desire and we want to take it now to a higher level than it's ever been before. That seeking, earning desire within us that says, I want more. I want to know more and understand more. I want to comprehend more. I'm not satisfied with the little dribbles of truth that I may have for my life. I'm not satisfied with the small pieces or even the questions and content there. I want to seek and know and I want to discover more. What we have right here in this moment is this wonderful place called Matthew 5, 14 through 16. Yes, we're in a Matthew 5, 14 through 16 moment and we have a Matthew 5, 14 through 16 vision here at City of Light. And that vision is this, to be a city, a community, a church of light. And that light is the truth that shines brightly in the darkness. Of light that illuminates in cases of compassion, showing God's love, or places of inclusion where we all come together in diversity, or places of empowerment where we come to learn and seek and search and find answers to live a positive spiritual life that's vibrant. We're built on a hill, this city. That hill is that higher understanding, a clear awareness, that's what it is, a true understanding and comprehension, a consciousness that our way of thinking is clear and bright on this wonderful promises of God. And you know what? Matthew 5, 14 through 16 says, a city like that cannot be hidden. It's high and lifted up. Well, I tell you what, it's literally happening for us because what the building, 19-story building, is gone. We can't be hidden anymore because what? We're right on the interstate now. We are the frontage property. 
Where we are right now is the city on a hill where that rise that comes up off of the interstate, we're there. We're living it out, not only in the physical, but even more so, we're living it in the spiritual. We have this great vision for the present and one that creates a dynamic future as well. It's one that we cannot take lightly, so you know what? We've got a vision to be a city of light, and we can't take that lightly. We can't take it with just a feeling like, oh, whatever. We've got to embrace it. We've got to hold on to this incredible vision for we are in this Matthew 5, 14 through 16 moment that we're living in this world. And we have been given something precious and we cannot let it slip away from us. It will if we're not focused, if we're not intentional, if we're not grasping it and embracing it to its fullest. Last week, I had the opportunity to perform my niece's wedding. What a wonderful moment to be a pastor, to be a member of the clergy, and to unite a couple in holy matrimony. I love weddings. Some pastors say, oh, it's a lot of hecticness, a lot of craziness, a lot of things with little flower girls and, and ring bearers that never behave and go off running down aisles and screaming and hollering, mommy, mommy, and saying all kinds of things. Bridesmaids who don't pay any attention and pass out because they've locked their knees and faint and all these kind of commotion of people and guests wondering where to sit and how to sit and family feuds as someone sat on the wrong side. Oh, but I love those moments when we all get together and we share commitment with one another. Last week in this wedding, I had the opportunity to share those wedding vows and to offer a charge to this couple. I write it in every ceremony that I've offered now for almost 30 some years as a pastor. And it is a phrase that says, I charge the couple to keep your love alive. I charge you to work at this. You've got to keep that love alive. I put that earnest intention and desire within you, saying this, that love is dynamic. Whoa, it's wonderful. And you know, on wedding days, everybody's like, oh, oh, so filled with love. And we grab these tissues and we cry. We weep a little bit. We see the bride coming down the aisle. We think this beautiful, glorious moment. We see the two coming together and join hands. And we think, oh, love is so sweet and powerful and wonderful. But I remind them that love can slip away if it's not attended to. For there are forces that would seek to destroy love, forces of self-focus. Or we get so caught up in our own agendas, our own issues. Forces of distractions of life. The very stress of living. In moments of discouragement, a belief that, you know what, I think there's something better out there. Maybe I made a mistake and I need to look for someone else. But when love lives, I remind them. In the ceremony, I said, when love lives as it does here today in this moment, it demonstrates the power of the universe to overcome. For love is based in commitment, and I charge you to keep that love alive. And today, as a pastor, I charge you to keep this new vision that we've just birthed, City of Light, to keep it alive to keep it like a flame that's burning within our hearts, within our very being, within our consciousness, within our way of thinking that we see every single moment. I'm a light for the world. I'm called to shine, to shine brightly and to bring illumination to a world of darkness because the world is so full of questions and wondering and so confused. And I mean that with the most loving intentions. It's a call of God placed on us to go and to bring explanations, education, insight, illumination, to help answer the questions for those who are searching and seeking. That is the call of God for this church. And that's the call of God for each and every one of us. So wait a minute. How do we keep this vision alive? How do we keep it alive? How do we keep anything alive? Well, I want to tell you this. Here's the secret. By not limiting it. By not limiting it. You keep things alive like love. Oh, and you don't limit it. Let it flourish. Let it flow. When you give it, when you share it, when you know that there's just so much love to give, you just give and give and give. You know what? It stays alive and it's vibrant. A marriage is so exciting when couples are so engaged in giving love to one another. They wake up and think, what can I do for my sweetie? Oh, and the other partner saying, what can I do for my sweetie? 
And you know, one says, I'll go get coffee. And the other one says, oh, I'll slip out of bed early and I'll go get some donuts. And one comes up with the coffee. Where'd you go? And the other one's gone with the donuts looking for, where are you with the coffee? And so it is that the excitement and the confusion of everyone just wanting to be so in love with one another and demonstrating that love. So engaged in doing those acts of kindness, compassion, and demonstrating that commitment to be there for one another. Love is alive by not limiting it, and so is vision alive by not limiting it anyway. We must be free to grow, to flourish, to always walk each day without limitation. For the worst place we can be, the worst place we can be is in that feeling of lack. A feeling of limitation, a feeling as if, well, I don't have. A feeling like, well, life, love, or this vision, well, it's just too great. It's too much. It's overwhelming. It's too impossible. We can't do this. It's just, I'm small. I'm limited. I, I'm insignificant. This isn't the way. I can't carry this burden of the vision or the immense love that is called of my life to share. You see, when we put those kind of limitations on us, when we feel limited, what we do is we construct walls, walls and barriers that go up, that block the divine flow of God's very desire for our lives. We construct those barriers, and you know what? We have the power to tear those barriers down. But so often we construct them and we build like a dam that when we entertain the feeling that the source of everything that comes to us, we've cut it off. We've cut it off because we believe in the very word limitation and we embrace it we just don't think that there's enough so we act like the oil is going out like there's not enough oil for our lamps to burn bright we feel like the source is being cut off have you ever been there where you've set a campfire and you've got a limited amount of wood a limited amount of fuel for the fire but you see those embers glowing and glowing 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 and you know the fire is going to go out any moment you kind of feel hopeless. You feel like, oh, I, I'm losing this. It's slipping away from me. You feel a hopelessness. And let me tell you this. Hopelessness is not of God. Hopelessness is not of God. It's the absence of God in our lives. The absence of the awareness of God in our lives. And so we live in this world of thinking limitation that there's only so much. We hold back. We hoard. We only say, you know, I can only do so much because there's just not enough. And living from that place can be one of the most disastrous places for our vision, for our love, for our life, for keeping anything alive. Here's the secret. We only have to abide in these things. Here it is. The fact that God is always with us. Omnipresent. Say that word with me because it's a big one. Omnipresent. Okay, omnipresence. I like it even better saying it's omnipresence because God is presence. God is right now in Australia as God is here. God is right now in China as God is here. Right now in North Dakota as right now in Florida. Right now, everywhere. For that is what this infinite presence is all about. So when you're walking down the road and thinking limitation, when you're thinking lack and when you're thinking, well, wait a minute, this is too great. This is too much for me to do. You've got to remember, wait a minute. I'm walking with God. God's presence is right here. What am I thinking, limitation? Because all the source of the divine is right with me at all moments of my life. I just have to wake myself up. Become alert, become conscious, change my thinking from this kind of crazy thought that I just don't have enough to welcoming this embracing thought that says, well, the presence of God, the infinite one is with me. The next is we only have to abide in omniscience. The fact that God is all knowing and knows our need even before we even ask. Omniscience, okay, another big word. Let's say it together. Omniscience. You know what? Omniscience, God already knows. God knows everything. Right now, God knows every aspect of your life. The consciousness, the great ideas of God, the all infinite knowing of God is all around you and knows exactly what you went through yesterday, knows exactly what you're going through now and is with you right by your side. Isn't it wonderful to know that there's somebody who knows what's going on in our life? Because boy, oh boy, we like to pick up the phone. We like to tell people, don't we? 
Sometimes we get into telling them a little too much. It's called gossip. And we want to tell everybody, well, you know what's happening in my life. And we go on and on and on. And you know what's happening in everybody else's life too. We want to tell everything. We get caught up in that. But isn't it wonderful to know that you're not alone? One of the scariest things in our life is sometimes we think we're facing a challenge. And we think we're the only one going through that. How many of you can say, yes, I've been there. I thought I was the only one. Yep. How many of you thought you were the only straight person in the world? Uh-huh. How many of you thought you were the only gay person in the world? How many thought you were the only lesbian? How many thought you were the only cross-dresser or transgendered person or whatever it may be? Yes, we got to have We always thought we were the only one. There is no one who's going through the thing like me. And nobody knows the trouble I've seen is our song. Oh, but God does. God has always known. God has always been there, always with you, always by your side, and knows exactly, exactly what you have need, better than you know what you have need of. The next one is we only abide in omnipotence. Ah, another one. I'm giving you all these big words. Omnipotence. Say it with me. Omnipotence. That was convincing. One more time. Omnipotence. Okay, I know it's a big word and it's early in the morning, but you'll wake up to it. The fact that God is all-powerful and is able to exceedingly abundantly above all give what we think. Uh, there's power. Okay, present, all-knowing, all-powerful. So when you're going through those situations in life and you feel limitation all around you and lack wanting to come at you and you want to gain this kind of consciousness and way of thinking that says, oh my Lord, there's just not enough. The Lord says... What are you talking about? I never left you nor forsake you. I've always been present and my generous heart is ready to give and bestow. I know what you have need of and the power that I have within is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or think. Wow. If we could just grasp these thoughts when fear begins to grip, grip us and shake, we can shake it. We can shake its hold on us when we begin to renew our awareness of these promises. Because, you know, many people have allowed fear to grip them and literally squeeze the life out of their vision. They have a vision, a dream, a possibility. And all they can think of is, wait a minute, my friends are telling me you're dreaming too big. Oh, my friends are telling me this is way out of line. You're not gifted, talented, or creative enough for this. Or my friends are telling me, you don't have the power. You don't have the ability. You don't have the strength. Or on goes the list of the words who are the doubters and the haters who want to come and talk to us constantly and tear down and destroy those things that we may have as inspiration within our lives. And we as a church, we have a dynamic vision to be this brilliant light that's shining bright, that is transforming the world with a positive spiritual pathway that enables them to come to God and understand the power within their lives. Oh, don't let anyone take that vision away from you or diminish it or discourage it. We guard it. Many people have allowed fear to grip them and squeeze the life out of visions. And what happens is they've taken their eyes off of these promises, the very principles of God, and they forget God is able. Because we live and move, we breathe and exist in God, and God is within us and is able, able, able. Yet we think we are the ones who, well, we constantly have to do the work. And we have to figure out the how. And we get in the way of God's desire to unfold all the answers. We just have to remember, we're the willing vessels. God is the potter. We're the willing vessel. And when we allow that potter to shape, mold, create, beautiful things begin to happen. For here's the spiritual tip that we read today. This beautiful text. Take that home. Make sure you take this bulletin home with you because when you get this, this is amazing because it's echoed in three Gospels. The same thing taught over and over again because remember not all Gospels share the same thing. They may share new insights or different truths or whatever, but when you find it echoed, wow, this must have been a big deal. A big deal. Because it's in every Gospel writer. Every Gospel writer is bringing this truth to us. Saying to those who listen, yeah, listen. Wow, okay, that's a big problem for a lot of us in today's world. We don't listen. We think we listen. 
We've got the cell phone going, the radio going, the TV going. We're carrying on conversation as we're reading a book. And are we listening to any of it? We've just got noise and clutter and going on and on and on all around us. Have we lost the fine art of listening? Because the Scripture says if those who listen, meaning that it is a skill, it is an art, it is a spiritual discipline. Those who listen to my teaching, Jesus says. Listen to my teaching. More understanding will be given. When you listen to it, when you get it, when you've got it, even more is going to come to you. That's the very principle for our life, that when you get something and you begin to own it and you accept it and you acknowledge it, that God is ever-present, God is all-powerful, God is ever never leaving me nor forsaking me. God knows best and God is able to do the miraculous. When we know that understanding and we embrace it, that's the basis. It's only going to get better. Ooh, I love that. The Scripture says to those who listen, have embraced, recognized this teaching, well, more will be given. An abundance of knowledge of truth is coming your way. But for those who are not listening, distracted, shiny things, you know, we're going off, you know what I mean? Those who are thinking about something else, those who come to church and go, when is he going to be finished? You know, I got things to do today. We're going to lunch. You know, uh, we got all this stuff. You know, we're distracted. We're not listening. We're not paying attention. Well, the little bit that you have, it's going to slip away from you. Listen, receive, take heed, pay attention to the teachings of Jesus. And let me tell you, more and more and more is going to be given to you. First, you, what you do is you acknowledge what you have. We have some amazing spiritual truths that are taught to us as Jesus unfolded for us some dynamic way of living. Start with those promises. John chapter 17, verse 21. Jesus said this beautiful prayer. I pray. I pray for those who believe. That's you and me. Yeah. That all of them may be one. One Father. One in the source. Just as you, O oh God. You Father. You source. You and me, we're one. Just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe. Wow. Jesus' prayer was that you would understand this oneness. That the very presence, all-powerful, the very knowledge, all-knowing, that the very uh, gifted God of love is always there with you. You may understand this oneness with it. You're not removed. You're not separated. There's not a big gap. There's not a big distance right here. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is within right you. Oh, how close. How close could it be? It's so close that you can't even find it. You know, it's kind of those things that are right under your nose. You know, you're walking around and you're looking, where are my glasses? Where are my glasses? And they're right here, you know what I mean? And you can't find them. You're looking all over for them because they're right under your nose. And so often we're looking for the kingdom of God and we don't realize, ooh, it's that close. A breath. It's just right there within me to recognize and to acknowledge how wonderful that is. Jesus wanted us to know and acknowledge that we are one with God. God whose source is their ever supply for all things. That source, the presence of God within us. Jesus taught us to understand that this is an infinite source you can be tapped into. And you are tapped. You can let it unfold from you. For everything comes from within. Think about this. Even nature teaches us that. Do you ever go out into the wonderful vineyards or, or orchards? Like the fruit on the tree... You look at it and you think, how did those luscious peaches, how did those beautiful ripe red apples or those golden pears get there? Do you ever wonder? Does somebody come by and attach that fruit? Does somebody come by and like hook on all those gorgeous oranges one by one? You know, like Christmas decorations that you put on a tree. Get those little wire hooks, you know, and fasten them on. No, we know that's not true. Okay. Does another tree provide fruit for another one? Does the tree next to you say, hey, I've got abundance. I'm making fruit here. I'll make sure you've got fruit too. No, that isn't how it works. Does one branch of the tree make sure the other branches have fruit? Nah, that doesn't work either. 
But each tree bears fruit from within itself, from its very source within, through the life and flow of the branches, fruit now bears. For the source of that juicy red apple is deep within the makeup of the tree, and it has the ability to produce from its inner source, and so it is with you. You have an ability within to bring forth great fruit, to shine when you tap into that oneness and understand God is right here to work in and through you and to manifest some incredible things. Now, when we tap into this truth, we truly receive it, we embrace it. We know that the infinite source is ready to offer us even more understanding. More is coming to you. More is coming to you. Are you getting ready for that? Even more is coming to you. Wow. So you acknowledge what you have. We have a great vision to be city of light. A vision to illuminate the world that is in darkness with this light of truth. Wow. If we're just here at this level, mark this day, November 16, 2014. We're birthing this vision. We just launched it. Can you imagine a year from now? What are we going to be talking about? Two years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, we're going to be remembering this moment, this vision that we imparted to be a light for the world is transformational. And we're going to look back and say, wow, do you remember when a handful of us were gathering together and we began to talk about it? Some complain about it. Some all their, you know, get together and say, well, I'm not sure I'm on board with it. I don't know how it fits and all that. But we did it. We shared this vision together and now look where we are because that which we began to understand now began to mushroom and flow and become even greater. This is the promise of God. Now we understand that this power and presence comes from a source of unlimited possibilities. So we fear not, and we don't bring fear into our thinking because you know why? We're the church that says I can. We're the church that says I am. We're the people of God that acknowledge the teachings of Jesus that invite us to walk on the chaotic waters of life without knowing how, yet simply knowing that God is at work and doing the miraculous through us. So say it with me, I can, I am. I think you can, and you am. So let's do it one more time, because I thought I heard something. I can, I am. I can, I am. That's the church that's really claiming the vision and owning it. Now this text, I love it, repeated over and over, says he or she who has will get more. It's true of everything in life. When you acknowledge what you have, you're only going to get more of it. But if you don't acknowledge what you have, well, how can you get anything more because you don't even appreciate or value? So when we acknowledge what we have, we wake up every day focusing on what we think we don't have or need. We live in limitation. But when we start saying, I live in abundance, wow, we build on that and more comes to us. Because we think we are limited, we hold on to what little we think we have. And you know what? The scripture is saying, you begin to lose it. That's what it is. Do you ever hear that saying that says, you use it or you lose it, you know? You use this or you lose it, you know? You use it or you lose it. Some of us are losing it. Uh, so we got to use it. We use that talent. You've got talent out there. You've got all kinds of talent that you've been... Are you using it or are you losing it? You've got muscles, spiritual muscles. You've got spiritual wisdom. You've got understanding. You use it or you lose it. You use your faith or you lose your faith. You step out in believing or you get weaker and weaker and you don't know how to take risks. You don't know how to walk on that water. You don't know how to move mountains. You don't know how to see buildings crumble before you and the walls of Jericho fall down. Because you don't use it. There's a problem. People are not using their faith. And they're growing weak, weak, weak as believers. And then they lose their power and the initial fire that burned within them. And they walk away one day from their dynamic spiritual life that they once had because they're not using it. I want to tell you this. When's the last time you stepped out in faith? You really stepped out in faith and says, Ooh, I don't know, you know. I, I could tithe, but you know, I don't have enough because I believe in lack and limitation, so I'm really not going to tithe. 
I'd be scared to tithe. I'd be frightened to tithe. It's not wise to tithe. It's a, you know, we go through all the rationale in our lives. So we don't step out in faith believing that we believe in a God of abundance. A oh, God of abundance for something else other than finances because we're looking for a God of abundance to give us blessings of all kinds of materialism and then instead of demonstrating that we already have. And so we give from that perspective. You use it or you lose it. At the wedding, my niece said to me, Uncle Tim, she calls me Uncle Tim. My name is Timothy Paul. I got a big, long name. My niece said to me, how do we keep this love alive? Well, for us, how do we keep this vision alive? I said this, you remember that moment when you and your fiance, you met and you got into Chris's truck and I remember you coming over to grandma and grandpa's house. I remember you pulling up the drive and the two of you were snuggled so close. I mean, you know, I thought you were both driving the car. It was just like, I couldn't get a Bible between the two of you if I tried. I mean, you looked like you were one. I mean, it was this, you know, conglomeration of so tightly intertwined with each other. You snuggled so close to your honey, honey, that all I could think of was like, when will the two of them come apart? Now, as the years go on, you may find that all that newness and excitement has worn off and you may sit a bit further away from him. And when you get into that truck, you may be some days in the middle, some days over a little bit further, and there's going to be some days you're going to be hanging onto the door handle and your head hanging out the window. I know that. And you're going to be wondering, where's the magic? Where's the spark? Where's that love? Where's that dynamic Prince Charming that swept me off my feet on my wedding day? And I'm going to say to you, just remember, who moved? He's still in the driver's seat. You have the opportunity to scoot across the seat and get closer. If you want to keep that love alive, if you want to keep that dream alive, if you want to keep living alive, if you want to keep your vision alive, I'm going to tell you today, scoot across the seat and snuggle up with God. God doesn't move. God's been driving all along. Some of us have been hanging out the window, hanging under the door handle. Some of us have been so distracted, we've moved to the back seat. Some of us are not even aware that we're in the vehicle. It's time to get on and scoot across the seat and cozy on up. For Jesus said, greater things than this shall ye do. This is your vision, city of light. Greater things. Not about what you're seeing here today, but greater things than this shall you do. This is what we're launching. This is what we're believing for our own lives. For each one individual, for collectively as a church, for us as a congregation, for us as a light that touches the world. Greater things. This is what it's all about. It's time to scoot across the seat. Are you ready? We're going to snuggle up with God. Amen. Lord, prepare me. To be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Oh, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. you